Kurt, what should we know about China from your point of view? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, I think by an order of magnitude, it's the most consequential and important bilateral relationship that the United States will ever have, both from our past and into the future. It's an incredibly dynamic, complex country. It can't be easily described in even a few sentences. I think the people essentially are uh, very favorable and friendly towards the United States. I think occasionally we have challenges. This will be an extraordinarily complex relationship. They will have elements of uh, uh, friendly relations, uh, but also it will be overlain by competition. And the key for this generation of diplomats and future uh, diplomats is to ensure that that competition does not veer uh, towards conflict and confrontation. Uh, uh, Cheng Li, you're uh, nodding your head. Weigh in. Mm, well, jump, jump in, huh? I think that uh, probably I will use the word. I agree with everything Kerr said. I think China is a paradox of hope and fear. Ah. Hope that the country could contribute to the global economy mm -hmm. with the emerging middle class. It is the largest market in the world, and a lot of talented people, they are everly, you know, integrated with the outside world. But at the same time, it could be a problem because the environment, the pollution, and mm. uh, the, the, also the country still has a political system. It's not a democracy. And uh, that uh, certainly have a lot of problems in the country. Even, even in China's economy, there's some serious concern about the property bubble, overcapacity, shadow banking, and local debts. This uh -huh. also will hurt the global economy. On top of that, there's some serious tensions between China and Japan, oh. and we will probably lead to some kind of a conflict if not handled in a rational, careful way, and uh, by itself and also by its neighboring countries. Including you suggest United it States. could uh, lead to some kind of a conflict, Julia, uh, Ambassador Block, and I'll call you Julia henceforth. Call me Julia. Henceforth, okay. Uh, <laughs> is is the tension between uh, China and Japan so severe right now that it could lead to conflict? I think it's very, very dangerous uh -huh. because the issues between China and Japan are not just political or economic or ideological. It is really, really based on history, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, World War II. Mm -hmm. It is basically emotional uh -huh. and until and unless the two countries can resolve those issues. Uh, the fact that China wants Japan to own up to what they did during World War II, mm -hmm. the Nanjing Massacre. Mm -hmm. We have Japanese uh, broadcasting officials going around the country in Japan saying that, hey, the Nanjing Massacre never happened. Mm. That in fact, it was the United States who concocted all this to hide our misdeeds. Mm. Now, Go ahead, uh, Nancy, uh, jump into the conversation and uh, uh, Julia's put on the table this idea of it's an emotional issue uh, as opposed to maybe a political issue. Or how, how do you see it? Asia Foundation invested all in the area. Huh? Well, that's right. Um, we've invested in, in all of the region, but I, I do think there is a historical dimension to this that is underestimated. Mm -hmm. I think it's very much like the emotional connection that people feel toward Taiwan, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the historical nature of the conflict is personal. You know, it's not just governmental. It doesn't have to do with just the war or World War II legacy. It's personal. Mm -hmm. um, your parents remember the days of the Shanghai occupation. They remember the signs that says, you know, dogs only or something like that in, in the French Quarter. I mean, these things are very emotionally driven as well as uh, historically driven. Uh, Kurt, you were involved in the, and, and everybody just uh, cross talk and jump into the conversation. Don't let me uh, run it all. But you were in the uh, Obama administration so heavily invested in this pivot this idea of uh, guiding our foreign policy in the direction of Asia. This uh, tension between the two countries, uh, Japan and China, uh, really throws a wrench into that, doesn't it? Puts the United States in a kind of a tough position? Yeah, I, I, uh, I agree with uh, much as w uh, what has been said uh, already. And I have seen uh, myself in meetings between diplomats who are suave and sophisticated, the 
the pain uh, of uh, history playing out mm -hmm. before my eyes. I think what has transpired is that for uh, at least a generation, senior uh, Japanese friends have wanted generally to have better relations with China, mm -hmm. sometimes on their own terms, but still have desired for commercial and economic pur purposes deeper ties between Tokyo and um, Beijing. What's happening in Japan politically now is that there is a substantial swing in attitude uh, that uh, is much more hostile towards China. Mm. Um, and so in many respects the negativity is matched on both sides and there are some of the historical dimensions that, that uh, create bad will, um, uh, uh, deep misgivings, not just in China, but across uh, Asia more directly. Now, my own sense is that the, the, the real purpose and the um, idea of the rebalance or pivot was, was really not that it was aimed at a particular country mm -hmm, mm -hmm. or a set of issues, but it was premised on the idea and the conception that the United States has invested an unbelievable amount of money, our national troops and treasure in the Middle East and South Asia. Those are important things, but really, in a fundamental sense, our future lies in Asia Pacific region. Uh, no, re no region will um, respond more favorably <laughs> to American en engagement. No region will reward more a strong steady, subtle American engagement. And so my own personal sense is that it is critical that the three great nations of Asia find a way to work together, Japan, China, and the United States, and very quickly, soon thereafter, uh, India as well. There needs to be more dialogue across the board. And my own particular view is that the only country that can really help um, facilitate, not, not uh, uh, mandate, but mm -hmm. facilitate carefully dialogue behind the scenes is the United States. Wow. Uh, take a little break. Um, and uh, for those of us uh, who are, uh, well, I'm privileged to sit at the table, and you are as well at home, uh, listening to four people who are heavily uh, invested in China, who know China, who know the region. And uh, this is a good learning experience for us. So we'll take a little break. Back on the other side, this is America and the world. This is America is brought to you by the National Education Association, the U.S.-China Education Trust, and the F.Y. Chang Foundation. The League of Arab States, representing 350 million people in 22 member countries. The Rotondaro Family Trust, the Embassy Series, uniting people through musical diplomacy, presenting international artists in diplomatic settings. And Ventana Productions, television facilities, editing and distribution services. Let me go around the table and introduce everybody. Nancy Yuan, Vice President and Director of the Asia Foundation here in Washington, D.C. Kurt Campbell, Chairman and CEO of the Asia Group and former Assistant Secretary of State for East Asian Affairs. Dr. Chang Lee is with us, Senior Fellow and Director of Research at the John L. Thornton China Center at Brookings Institution and Ambassador Julia Chang Block, who is the founder and president of the U.S. China Education Trust. Uh, you see their name at the top and the bottom of our show. We thank you very much for your support. Former U.S. Ambassador to the Kingdom of Nepal. Let's talk a little bit about the quality of life for the average person in China. What is it, Julia? Now, average. China is a huge country yep. with a huge population. Now, if you talk about the people on the coast, in Beijing, in Shanghai, Guangzhou, they are living increasingly a life like yours and mine, uh -huh. a middle-class life uh, with access to anything that you probably can get in the United States and more. And China now is the biggest market for luxury brands. Mm -hmm. But then if you want to talk about the other China, 
the China in the interior, in the villages that may not have changed since the Tang Dynasty. You're talking about a population that is living still on practically a dollar a day. Oh, wow. And their lives have not caught up with today, the modern age. And I think that is one of China's biggest problems. So, so let me ask you this question. If there's 1.3 billion people in China, what, and there's been a great raising up of the middle class, so to speak, how many people are in this middle class or higher, and how many people are still living in poverty, as Julia mentioned? Well, according to some studies conducted in China, about 23% uh, of population uh, belong to middle class. 23? Yes, and, uh, uh, well, uh, someone said that it's about 250 million people. Okay. So that makes China as a very high in terms of middle class, you know, uh, kind of a population. Maybe currently it's a third or fourth. But uh, as uh, Kurt said, uh, Asia is so important. In 2030, the t I mean, the top five middle class country, four of them are in Asia, uh, uh, basically in Asia. Start not with China, but India, China, uh, then United States, then Japan, and Indonesia. So mm -hmm. that's the landscape change. Huge, huge. And also, what makes China extraordinary is the what the uh, uh, ambassador just said: you know, the migration from poor China, rural China, yeah. to urban China. Uh, according to Chinese government statistics, in the next two or three uh, uh, decades, there will be 300 million people, roughly the size of U.S. population move from rural area to urban area. Was that movement from rural to urban uh, encouraged or forced? Well, it's uh, largely encouraged, uh, encouraged? In, the, in the world. It's urbanization because uh, you don't need to have so many people in to, rural China. To, yeah. uh, but also the, they needed to, to jobs, yes. right? Yeah. To, to do the manufacturing. To jobs and right? improvements in their lives. And if you look at China's secondary cities, not just Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou, the secondary cities are huge. Mm -hmm. um, so there is this huge influx. There, there's, um, there's a huge number of cities in China that that no one in the United States has ever heard of. Heard with, of or can pronounce. With, <laughs> with, pop, with populations yes. Yes. over 10 million. So, 10 million? Yeah. Wow. So oh, wow. Uh, yeah, and that's like incredible. the biggest here yeah. in the United States. Yeah. Yeah. The, the other thing, and, and this just, I think, plays on the points that have already been nicely made, is that we often talk about when China uh, in its aggregate sense will surpass the United States in terms of economic performance and you know there's all measurement along these lines but what people forget is that China really is uh, becoming a great power but it, it's the only power that's come to this status with still a very large part of its population mm -hmm. still living near or at the poverty line and so really I think for the foreseeable future we often talk about what does China want in the world? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, Where are mm -hmm. they going? When, when you really plumb the depths of most of the thinking of the senior Chinese leaders, they are still focused primarily on the unimaginably difficult challenges that they face at home, whether it's, whether it's what we've already heard in terms of the urban migration, the pollution problems, yep. the labor issues, the issues of <coughs> corruption. It is, uh, it, it is enough to keep you up at night. The, the amazing thing I have to say is, you know, we often look at pictures of American presidents and how quickly they age when they're in office. Yes, 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 yes. Ch Chinese leaders are sort of the reverse. They look younger the longer they're in power. But Why is in, that so? I don't know. I, good, oh, good. I would venture a guess. I, I, what, what is the guess? What is the guess? Oh, should I say it? Yes, oh, you yeah. should. Yes. Well, yes. I mean, I'll, I'll, it's I'll, just I'll, between the five of us. No, so. <laughs> China, just to give you a sense, there, uh, Asia has more plastic surgery, more... Ah. Uh, uh, you know things associated with the uh, appearance, not just with women, with the, uh, but also with men, than the rest of the world combined. Whoa, 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 but whoa, I whoa. think it's the hair dye. dye. Yeah. The hair dye. Have you it's ever huge. seen a gray-haired <laughs> Chinese leader? Not until any, they retire. Anywhere in Asia. <laughs> anywhere, <laughs> anywhere in Asia. Asia. But but they, but it, but it is remarkable. Meaning that the challenges are unbelievable. They could keep you up every night uh, of the time that you're in power. Just to go to this pollution business, I gather a million people a year are dying because of the premature death of, of there, uh, that it hurts tourism, of course, that it hurts the agriculture, 
because of the acid rain and things like that. So it's a huge problem. Is there any sign that uh, China is kind to uh, try? They did have this thing that I read in the paper the other day about their releasing reports uh, much more, much faster than any country in the world as to what what damage is being done by the pollution. Only huh? recently, yeah, 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 yeah. with yeah. Uh, really the pressure from the United States. Uh, but it took everybody by surprise, didn't it, that they were so transparent? Well, yeah, th there's a saying in China, when you want to look at the sun, actually it's really moon, look like moon, because you cannot see sun, because the pollution ah, reaches a degree. Mm -hmm. Let me ask Nancy, uh, the leadership in, the, uh, in, in, in China, uh, what do we know about them? Is reform really taking place? Uh, are, are there successes that, that we want to point to? I think there are some successes, and I think this area of open government information is one of those areas in terms of transparency in government. Uh, a number of years ago, they put into place uh, a regulation in 2008 that all new regulations would be subject to public hearings. And at this stage, about 80% of rulemaking is subject to public hearings, and it mm -hmm. gives people an opportunity, particularly in things like the environment, in rules and regulations that affect daily life. Uh, it gives the population an opportunity. So that's a big surprise, that the people are engaged in how the country is being run? I, I think there's a demand for it, and this is a trend that's uh, been increasing across Asia, actually, mm -hmm. in other countries as well. But how do you balance that, which you just put on the table, which kind of surprises me a bit, uh, because I just don't know, uh, with the uh, repression and control, political control, of the media and censorship, huh? Well, they coexist. Um, I would say huh. that there are a lot of things that coexist in China that you would not expect. Give me, give me, give me an example. Well, that's one that's right on the table, but what, what else would we think um, about? I would say that there are uh, a lot of opportunities for civil society to participate, mm -hmm. uh, to have programs, uh, to really work in the social services area. Hmm not so much on sort of human rights and political reform. Mm -hmm. And I think that that does coexist. I think Chung has written about this as well. These, these dynamics coexist within China, and I think the government does uh, work on issues where they think it contributes to stability mm -hmm. and stability in the society. Yeah, I just want to add uh, what Nancy said, that uh, give you some kind of example. Yes, on the one hand, you see the uh, severe media control and the censorship and uh, target some of our opinion leaders. Mm -hmm. at the the same activists, time, the correct. activists. Correct. At the same yeah. time, you do see the commercialize of the media, and uh, you see the new media, social media. Now, I grew up in China, and uh, in the 1960s, even the uh, 1970s, uh, there's a, the whole country, there's only a few newspapers. I remember that my later father always complained that when he uh, read People's Daily, he said, all the lies, you know, even oh. the weather is a lie. <laughs> we cannot say Mao's birthday is a raining day. It's always a, a, a sunny day. It's a sunny day. But now there are thousands of newspapers, uh, hundreds of televisions, and uh -huh. hundreds of radio stations. Of course, not, they are not telling the same story. And uh, if we observe Chinese media, you see the diversity. You yeah. see there some journalists choice. really uh, push the envelope. Mm -hmm. So that's a hope. So China is in the period, I think that my colleague uh, also, you now if you look at the Taiwan, look at South Korea, they yeah. also went through these kind of difficulties. Uh -huh. So yeah. the interesting thing is, is how that change, will, uh, the social change, societal change, will really become a political force to change the China's, or improve uh -huh. China's political system. Yeah. So we do not have the timing, but that's the issue. It's, I mean, I, I, I agree, it's a very complex mix of uh, again, some repression uh, that's becoming much more efficient um, uh, and uh, technologically sophisticated. That is undeniable. But it also coexists with some very interesting social dynamics. And I'll just give you, you asked yeah, for yeah, examples. Yeah, yeah. Let me yeah. give you. Good. Let me give you two. Uh, this is this one is actually pretty well known. But a couple of years ago, there was a, a show in which. Um, uh, uh, Chinese viewers, the uh, largest TV market in the world, were asked to vote on who they thought was the best young singers, a group of young singers. And lo and behold, uh, by some measurements, it's, it was actually the largest election ever conducted. Uh, hundreds of millions of people voted for this 19-year-old girl. Now, it only happened once, and I think people understood the sensitivities there. 
But th that's one example. Uh, th there was a incredible. But that's a safe election, well, no, isn't no, it? No, but 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 it but it shows you that there is some experimentation in social ah, okay. circles, but also the sensitivity involved. I think immediately thereafter they decided to take the show in a different direction. But another classic case is there was a show last year, which is which is hysterical. It's it, it, you know I I work with a lot of young. Chinese women, and they, you know, it was very popular for a time. Some very sophisticated Chinese women in their twenties and thirties, and they are not dissimilar from upmarket Asian women in the rest of Asia. They don't want to get married quickly. They enjoy going out. They enjoy luxury items, and so there was this. There are, and they interview men, and, and they come on the stage, and they ask the questions, and and then they they, and then they decide whether. They would date this guy, right? Oh, so okay, these okay. <laughs> five very sophisticated Beijing women are in it, and this guy came on the stage, and he was the classic kind of ideal of a revolutionary kid. No money, uh, and uh. and but but he was you know full of heart, and he said, "Look, I don't have a, I, I'll give you a ride on the back of my bike, and we're gonna we're gonna <laughs> sing revolutionary sh songs." And the girls go, "I'd I'd rather go in a Porsche. So I'd rather go in a Porsche." And so they, yes. that that show also didn't last very long. <laughs> there is there is uh, a, a, you put something on the table. We're talking about the uh, the young uh, uh, women. Is there an American? There's an American. Is there a Chinese dream? Oh my goodness, that is Xi Jinping's mantra, oh. uh, one of his mantras. Go ahead. Yeah. The Chinese dream. Okay. And he's plastered it out there. But you know, I'm not sure I know what exactly he means by the Chinese dream. Uh -huh. and, and, and in fact, uh, the U.S. China Education Trust, we were trying to think of a program comparing and contrasting the American dream uh -huh. and the Chinese dream. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. But I think, by and large, the two all aim to provide basically a better life uh -huh. Uh -huh. for the people. So our concept is, you know, a house in the suburbs and two cars and uh, so on and well, so forth. Is that's it, what a lot it's of pretty simple. <coughs> yes, that's it what a simpler, lot of uh, middle class Chinese are doing. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. I mean, they all have apartments, they're moving to the suburbs. Buying cars. And the, and uh -huh. the, and the, yeah, the bicycles are gone, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Oh, hardly any bicycles. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Nancy, it, uh, Nancy, well, no, I was going to say what, what Kurt had mentioned with regard to young women. I mean, they are really looking for people who have a house and have a car, have uh -huh. an education, have a future in terms mm -hmm. of an um, employment. They, they don't want to live at home. With they don't want to live at home yeah, with their yeah, parents. Yeah. I mean, yeah. in the old days, you live at home with your parents until you get married. Sure, sure, so, sure. I mean, sure, you sure, want sure. to have a life. And so I think that there are a lot of changes like that in China. <laughs> when we talk about uh, values, you know, American mm -hmm. values, uh, individuality, you know, optimism, so on and so forth, are there Chinese values that we should uh, be uh, focused in on and we should know about? Uh, family. Uh -huh. family. Family? Family? Uh, yeah, certainly the the Chinese Confucianism also has been challenged the first time by through the Cultural Revolution and the second by commercialization and the money worship. So it's already undergoing a lot of changes. But on the other hand, as the uh, uh, ambassador said, uh, in emphasis on family, emphasis on education uh -huh. and entrepreneurship, <coughs> hardworking, these kind of things. And you can see this also in uh, some other countries, including uh, uh, Americans. But uh, the emphasis on education, and I think it's one of the core yeah. values in China. Hard, yeah. hard work, yes. Yes. Hard work, hard work yeah. determination, respect uh -huh. for your elders. Um, I, I think a, um, uh, a respect for culture traditions, cultural traditions, a respect for order. I think sometimes a, almost a fear of disorder. Uh -huh. I mean, the, the, you know, I, I do believe that, that there is an aspirational quality in both China and the United States. And in fact, you know, in, in many respects, we are both great countries, big countries, have big personalities, sometimes smaller countries around us uh -huh. occasionally have issues with us. Um, oh, but, yes. I, I, <laughs> I, but, but, but I will also say, I, I do think there, there are some important differences, though. I think what, what animates, what has animated the United States historically is really a tremendous sense of optimism and expansion and a really sense that we have a lot of good to bring. Mm -hmm. I think at the heart, and this is, this um, uh, ambassador mentioned this, wh when we sort of plumb the depths of what um, President Xi is talking about, I do think part of it is aimed at a better life in China, but I think 
underneath it, there is also a sense of historical aggrievement, that, that they have not been treated as well as they should, and they are restoring their role in the world. And, and, and one of the things that we have to do in the United States is to see if we can work with China so that we help and assist their arrival on the global stage mm -hmm. in a responsible way and not be seen as the country that is trying to subvert or thwart China's arrival. And that, that is going to be the essential quality of American diplomacy for the next 50 years. But now, do, are, you, are you saying that uh, there's a feeling within China that they have been mistreated by the outside world? Absolutely. Yes. For information about my new book, The Chance of a Lifetime, and online video for all This Is America programs, visit our website, thisisamerica.net. And now you can follow us on Facebook and Twitter. This Is America is brought to you by the National Education Association, the U.S.-China Education Trust, and the F.Y. Chang Foundation. The League of Arab States, representing 350 million people in 22 member countries. The Rotondaro Family Trust. The Embassy Series, uniting people through musical diplomacy, presenting international artists in diplomatic settings. And Ventana Productions, television facilities, editing and distribution services.